Hello there, Mr. Sutton here bringing you the BC Calculus 518 Extra Practice Number 1 Solutions on Improper Integrals. For this first problem, we want the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over x cubed. Since we have a discontinuity at 0, and that's actually one of your limits of integration, that means we have an improper integral. So I'm going to set this up as a limit. I'm going to set this up as the limit as a approaches 0 from the right, because this is the leftmost, so we're going to the right to approach it, of from a to 1 of 1 over x cubed. And this is really, uh, let's see, I need to take my antiderivative now. This is really x to the negative 3. That bumps up to negative 2. So we have negative 1 half x to the negative 2, evaluated from a to 1. And now plugging in 1 and a, I'm actually going to start by uh, factoring out this negative 1 half. And now inside the parentheses, I've got this is essentially 1 over whatever you plug in. Uh, so this is going to be 1 over 1 squared minus 1 over a squared. And as I plug in, as I approach 0 for a, I've actually got 0 in the denominator here. So this limit does not exist, which means my integral diverges. For this problem, I want the integral from 1 to infinity of this expression here. Now, we have a discontinuity at 0, but that's not going to affect us on this one. What will affect us is this infinite upper limit of integration. That makes this an improper integral, so we actually have to convert this into the limit as b approaches infinity of the integral from 1 to b, and I'll rewrite this as x to the negative 1 third because I'm going to anti-differentiate it anyway. Uh, so now let's take that antiderivative. That bumps up to the 2 thirds power, multiply by the reciprocal of 3 halves, so we have 3 halves x to the 2 thirds evaluated from 1 to b as b approaches infinity. And now plugging those things in, I'm going to yank out my 3 halves here. And whatever you're doing in here, you're essentially cube rooting and then squaring. So I've got the cube root of b squared minus the cube root of 1 squared. As b approaches infinity, this term here is going to infinity, which drags the whole thing to infinity. So that means that we have an integral, then, that's going to diverge. On this problem, I want the integral from e to infinity of this expression. Since I'm going to infinity, I need to set my improper integral up with a, a legitimate limit. So I'll have the limit as b approaches infinity of integral from e to b, and then still have the same stuff inside. Now, this is going to take a little bit of work to integrate. Uh, I'm going to use substitution because I have an inner function here whose derivative might match up with this x out here. So I'm going to let my u value be ln of x. du then is 1 over x dx. And then to get dx by itself, I multiply by x. So that's x du that I can swap in for dx in a minute. Let me get my u values while I'm down here, though, because right now these limits of integration are x values. So if x is e, then that means u is going to be the ln of e, which happens to be 1. Works out nicely. And then if x is b, then ln of b is my u value. Substituting back into this expression now, we have limit as b approaches infinity, integral from 1 to ln of b, because we swapped those out. In here, I've got 1 over x times u squared. And the dx gets changed out for an x du. Oops, there we go. du, not dx. du. Because um, we want to change this over to u values. Um, so x's are going to cancel nicely. I'm going to write this as u to the negative 2 times du. And now I'm going to take my antiderivative, bumping that up to a negative 1 and dividing by negative 1. We've got negative u to the negative 1, evaluated from 1 to the ln of b. Again, b is still approaching infinity. This limit hasn't gone away. Uh, so plugging things in, we've got negative 1 over ln of b, and then minus, minus, so it's really plus 1 over 1. Evaluating this now, as b goes to infinity, this term becomes bottom heavy and goes to 0. So this is just 0 plus 1, essentially, which comes out to 1. For this problem, I want the integral from negative 1 to infinity of this expression. Now, since I'm going to infinity here, this is an improper integral. 
I'm going to rewrite it with a limit as b approaches infinity of negative 1 to b of all this stuff. And then uh, let's see here. What can I do next? Well, to integrate this, let me go ahead and, and try factoring this. I mean, there's nothing else I can do. Substitution's not going to work. There's no way to simplify this. Really, it's, it's partial fractions or nothing for this one. Um, so let me split this up. This is really x plus 2 times x plus 3. And it's worth noting that this has discontinuities at negative 2 and negative 3, but that actually doesn't have any bearing on this problem because it's negative 1 to infinity that we're doing for our limits of integration. All right, so I'm going to do my partial fraction dance. I'm splitting this up into a over x plus 2 plus b over x plus 3. And then I'm going to multiply everything by x plus 2, x plus 3 to get rid of the fractions. So that's just a 1 on the left. On the right, the x plus 2's cancel, so I've got a times x plus 3. And over here, the x plus 3 is going to cancel, so that's b times the other factor, x plus 2. At this point, I'm going to plug in some values of x that will allow me to isolate a and b. So I'm going to get a first. That means I want to get rid of b. So I'm going to choose an x value of negative 2. And if I plug that in, that zeroes out this b term. Then I just have 1 equals, let's see, negative 2 plus 3 is 1, so just 1a. Oh, so negative 2, or negative 1 rather, equals a. Nice. So I've got my a value. Let me find my b value now. I'm going to get that by plugging in negative 3 for x. That allows me to zero out the a term. So then I've got 1 on the left side. And over here, this is b times negative 3 plus 2, or negative 1. Well, if 1 equals negative b, then b equals negative 1. So now that I've got my a and b, I'm going to go back here and split up my uh, integrand. So I've got all this limit stuff still, but now I've got 1 for the a value over x plus 2. And then I've got minus 1 over x plus 3 for my b value. Okay, continuing on, and don't forget the dx when you do this. Continuing on, uh, antiderivative, we've got ln absolute value of x plus 2, and all this limit stuff is still hanging around. Um, except we don't have an integral anymore. We have an evaluation box that we're opening here. B is still approaching infinity, though. Now, over here, we have minus ln absolute value of x plus 3, evaluated from negative 1 to B. And this is where you got to be really careful. It's very tempting to just kind of plug things in and say, you know, okay, I've got essentially ln of B plus 2, and B is going to infinity, so that's going to infinity, and so I'm done. But wait a sec. We've also got this other term then going to infinity. So that's like infinity minus infinity, which is one of those indeterminate forms. Um, so rather than plugging everything in right away, I'm going to actually move these together into one big ln. So this is really going to be ln of x plus 2 over x plus 3. And this is what I am now going to evaluate. Um, so I've got let's see here, ln of b plus 2 over b plus 3 minus ln of negative 1 plus 2 over negative 1 plus 3. Now, the reason this is an improvement over what we had here is when I write it like a fraction like this, I can actually use some of my infinity reasoning here. Um, I've got two things, b plus 2 and b plus 3. As b goes to infinity, the b term here is dominant. So this is essentially ln of b over b. And then over here, I just have, this is going to be ln of uh, 1 half. Well, ln of b over b, that's really ln of 1, and the ln of 1 is 0. So this is 0 minus ln of 1 half, which I can just write as negative ln of 1 half. Or if you want to get real fancy and move this negative 1 inside as an exponent, you could also write this as positive ln of 2. Either way. For this problem, I want the integral from 0 to 1 of this craziness here. Now, on this one, um, at some point you're going to have to use some substitution, but before you do that, note that 1 makes this thing undefined. We have a discontinuity at 1, because 1 minus 1 to the 4th is 0 down here. Because we have that discontinuity at 1, this is actually an improper integral, and we have to evaluate this using limits. So instead of writing 1 up here, I'm going to put b, and I'm going to take the limit as b approaches 1, let's see, this is the, the rightmost limit, so this is going to be from the left side. So limit as b approaches 1 from the left of 0 to b. 
same stuff inside. Now let me go ahead and uh, use substitution. And I'm thinking substitution on this because, well, I've got, this is, this is kind of a weird setup, but this is kind of the, the arc sign format here. We have something over something, a square root of 1 minus something squared. So I'm, I'm thinking if I can take a u value of x squared and make this 1 minus u squared, I might be able to arc sign this thing. Um, but first things first, let's do our little u dance here. So we've got du equals 2x dx. Dividing by 2x, we've got dx is du over 2x. For u values, if x equals 0, then I have the u value 0 squared, or just 0. And if x is b, well, now I've got a u value of b squared. Plugging everything back in, I've got the integral, or the limit, rather, as b approaches 1 from the left, integral from still 0, but now we have a b squared up here. And I have 4x over the square root of 1 minus u squared. Um, so this is kind of a little weird. We don't usually do substitutions like this. Um, but in this case, it works. And now for dx, we're going to substitute du over 2x that we wrote over here. The 4x and the 2x kind of cancel, leaving us with a 2 up here. Not much else that we can do to simplify this, though. Um, at this point, it's time to take the antiderivative. Since I have 2 over the square root of 1 minus u squared, again, this is your arc sine format. This is going to be 2 arc sine of u evaluated from 0 to b squared as b approaches 1 from the left. All right, let's get to the bottom of this thing. Um, so this is, I'm going to yank out this 2, and inside we're going to have arc sine of b squared minus arc sine of 0. Now, as b approaches 1 from the left, um, if you're, you're essentially arc signing 1, because 1 squared is just 1. So arc sine takes an, a y value and gives you back the angle on the unit circle. So if you have the y value 1 that you're approaching, you're essentially going to be approaching, you're going to be getting an angle back of pi over 2, or 90 degrees. So this is pi over 2 for this piece of it. And then over here, if I plug in a y value of 0, the angle I get back is also 0. So we have this 2 out here. Inside we have a pi over 2 minus 0. Distributing and simplifying, we end up with just pi then. On this problem, I've got the function f of x equals x times e to the negative x squared for all real numbers x. And for the first part here, we want to know at what value of x are we getting an absolute max with justification. So this is kind of a nasty problem because they're asking for an absolute max, but they're not giving you a closed interval. So you can't use the candidates test on this one. Um, really, the only thing left then is looking at the critical values and hoping there's only one of them. So let's go ahead and get our first derivative and see what happens. So taking my first derivative, f prime, I'm going to use the product rule here. And I didn't have room for the box and ribbon with everything else I had on this page. Um, so I'm just going to do it out u prime v, u v prime style. Uh, so u prime v, we've got the derivative of the first thing times the second thing. Derivative of x is 1. We just have got we just have 1 times e to the negative x squared then. And then we need to do uv prime. Um, so that's going to be x times the derivative of e to the negative x squared. Well, the derivative of e to the negative x squared is e to the negative x squared times the tail of negative 2x. Since there's already an x here, I'm going to write negative 2x squared. There we go. Now we're going to set this equal to 0 and solve for critical values. So we've got a, an e to the negative x squared we can factor out, leaving us with 1 minus 2x squared. We can't make e to the negative x squared equal 0. And nothing here is going to be undefined, by the way, so we don't have to worry about those kinds of critical values. Um, but we can make this 1 minus 2x squared equal 0. If I subtract 1 and divide by negative 2, uh, I've got essentially x squared equals 1 half. Square rooting, I have x equals plus or minus the square root of 1 half. So those are our critical values we now have to test out. So here's my f prime line. Here's negative radical 1 half, positive radical 1 half. A number less than this would be a negative 1. And plugging that back in here, now this e to the negative x squared, this is always going to be positive because exponential terms, if they start positive, they stay positive. Uh, this stuff in here, though, could be positive or negative. If I plug in negative 1, 
2 times negative 1 squared, that's going to be just 2, but we're subtracting that from 1, so that's negative. Testing out 0 now, we've essentially got 1 minus 0, which is positive. And if I test out 1, well, since I'm squaring x, I get the same result with positive or negative of the same number. Uh, so that still comes out negative. And we're in a little bit of a bind here. We do have a local max at radical 1 half. The problem is we also have another critical value over here at negative radical 1 half. So although in its immediate area this is going to be our maximum, our local max, what about all the numbers over here? If we're decreasing until we get to this local min, that means if you go to the left you're increasing forever. And if you're increasing forever there's at least a chance you're going to hit something that's bigger than this local max. So we have to rule that stuff out. To do that, I'm going to look back at the original function. And I'm going to ask, where, does this, where is this function positive? Where is it negative? I mean, there's really no other option we have here. This is it. Um, so I'm going to set this stuff equal to 0 and see where we change from positive to negative. Now, the good news is solving this is pretty easy. e to the negative x squared, again, can't be 0. So it's just kind of a non-factor in this. Uh, so we can just write x equals 0 is the only critical value. For my number line now, this is an f number line, the original function, which is kind of rare on these problems, but it, it, it's useful here. We've got that border value of 0. If I plug in something to the left of 0, this e to the negative x squared has to be positive. Um, so it's really just down to this x factor. If I plug in a negative, x is negative. So the whole thing is negative. If I plug in positive 1, everything becomes positive. Well, this means that I only have negative outputs to the left of 0. Uh, so that means that even though these numbers are going up forever as we move to the left, they're all negative. Whereas the numbers to the right of 0, including whatever output you get from radical 1 half, those numbers are all positive. That means this local max here is going to be higher than any of the numbers over here just because it's positive and these are all negative. Um, so to write this out, f is less than 0 from negative infinity to 0, so there's no max over there. Um, so that means that since f prime changes from positive to negative at x equals radical 1 half, in other words, since we have a local max, that means we also have an absolute max at x equals radical 1 half. For this part of the problem, given this function, I want to just find the antiderivative. Now, for this one, we have an inner function, and we also have its derivative somewhere in there. Um, so I'm going to use substitution on this. So here's my function I'm trying to find the antiderivative of. And I'm going to let my u value equal negative x squared. I had a choice between x squared and negative x squared, and either one's actually going to end up working. We'll just go with this. Um, so my du then is going to be negative 2x dx. Dividing by negative 2x to get dx alone, I've got du over negative 2x. And since this is an indefinite integral, I don't have to worry about x values being turned into u values or anything like that. So I'm just going to substitute back in here. Um, so I've got then x times e to the u dx, except instead of dx, I'm going to write du over negative 2x. And I can cancel out the x's now. This is negative 1 half e to the u du. Taking my antiderivative of what I've got here, uh, this is an easy one. This is just negative 1 half e to the u plus c. But if I wanted to, I can substitute this negative x squared back in there. Um, so this is going to then be negative 1 half e to the negative x squared plus c. For this problem, they want us to find the value of the integral from 0 to infinity of x times this f of x, given this integral equivalence over here. Um, so this one is definitely kind of tricky. First thing to be careful about is since we're going to infinity, we have to rewrite this immediately as a limit on the outside. So I'm going to write this as the limit as b approaches infinity, integral from 0 to b of x times f of x dx. And then we actually have to take the monumental task of integrating this thing. It's tempting to replace f of x with this stuff up here, um, and then write it as like x squared times e to the negative x squared. But you're going to find that you can't really integrate it in that form because, I mean, if you try to use substitution, you're going to get an x left over after you cancel things out. Um, so that's not going to work. Instead, since we have two functions that we can't 
really do much with in terms of simplifying or substituting, we're going to use integration by parts. And part of how you know that you need to do this is they're giving you the value of an integral. And when you integrate by parts, you often end up with an integral that you're like, what do I do with this thing? Um, so let's write out the integration by parts formula. Here it is for definite integrals. We have uv evaluated from a to b minus integral from a to b of v du. Now we have to find uv, dv, and du. I'm going to start with u. I have a choice between x and this craziness up here. Um, which one would I rather take the derivative of? Well, I could go either way on this um, because I did have to take the derivative of this thing in part a, um, but I'm going to go with x. And I'll tell you why in just a sec. Um, but if I go with x, that's at least an easy derivative. Now for dv, you know, taking the something I'm going to need to take the antiderivative of, this doesn't look like something that's very fun to take the antiderivative of. But if you look back here on part b, we actually took the antiderivative of that very expression and came up with this stuff down here. And, and by the way, on part b, if you didn't substitute back in for u, um, now's a good time to do so. Um, so when we take our derivative of x, we have just 1 du, or 1 dx rather, du equals 1 dx. But this stuff now is just going to give us that expression we got at the end of part b, negative 1 half e uh, to the negative x squared. All right, moving on, we're going to multiply these two things together. So that's negative 1 half x e to the negative x squared evaluated from 0 to b again as b approaches infinity and now we're subtracting the integral from 0 to b of uh, we've got v du just following my 7 that I always make here uh, so this is just going to be all this stuff inside the integral we've got two negatives I'm going to cancel those and make a positive so I'm going to write plus integral from 0 to b 1 half e to the negative x squared dx okay moving on then I'm going to expand this first thing I'm going to yank out a negative 1 half, and then I've got, let's see, b times e to the negative b squared. So that's like b over e to the b squared, if I make it in fraction form. And plugging in 0, I've got minus 0 over e to the negative uh, 0 squared, which is just 0 squared. And for now, I'm just going to rewrite this integral. So evaluating one step further, I've got negative 1 half times, and now I have a b over e to the b squared as b approaches infinity. So we, we've got an indeterminate form, but if you follow the faster growing function kind of approach, we have an exponential versus a linear. This is a bottom heavy function, so it's going to zero as b approaches infinity. Over here, we've got zero over something that's not zero. This is just e to the zero, which is one down here. Um, so that's zero. And now we have this integral. Now they told us that the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative x squared was uh, pi, radical pi over two. So that's what this stuff is with a one half out in front. So when the dust settles, all of this stuff, by the way, you could stop here, but if you want to simplify, all of this stuff is just zero. Over here, we have 1 half times radical pi over 2, which is a final simplified answer of radical pi over 4. Whew!